Right, since morning we have been uh, listening to uh, purely many times, except for Ashley's uh, interaction with most of the most of the topics were clinical. Uh, we felt this is an occupational and uh, environmental health annual conference. Uh, sufficient emphasis uh, should be given on occupational uh, issue, health issues as well, because this forms the core, as you would have heard from different speakers during the inaugural session. So this topic, uh, which touches every physician's uh, job in any organization, I felt this would be useful to all the audience. Uh, we cut across uh, the, the different hats we we wear in terms of uh, different specialities, but this remains the core uh, subject. Uh, my presentation or interaction will be limited to these four areas that I would like to. Uh, the differentiate between safety and health hazards and demonstrate a practical methodology for undertaking health risk assessments and outline the reasons for undertaking health surveillance and identify some common health hazards in a industrial setup. So friends, if, as you know, health and safety uh, law places a duty on the employers to ensure the health as well as the safety of their employees. Yet each year, many more people become ill as a result of their work uh, then are killed or injured in industrial accidents. Most diseases caused by work do not kill, but can involve years of pain, suffering, and discomfort for those affected. That's the reason why we want to do health assessment and surveillance. Now the problems are too many, and the methodology is very difficult to actually operationalize on the ground. So that lot of gray areas, because we are in a in an area where science is not evaluated, it has not matured. Problems with identifying health risks are that health risks may not be understood or well defined and the cause and effect relationship are not established. Health risks that tend not to attract widespread publicity or demand the same urgent attention as safety risks. And it's, these two are quite, quite understandable because of the complexity people do not perceive them as important. Health risks appear to have little, if any, short-term effect, and it may be that ill health does not occur for many years of exposure. Many people, after their retirement, will suffer from diseases due to the causes where they were in service. So there is no direct relationship, 20, 40 years, as you would know from asbestosis. Health risks may be more difficult to address, resulting in attention being directed to risk where control is more visible and likely to attract tangible benefits. Comprehensive data on occupational ill health may simply not exist. That's the reality in most of the occupational health disorders, even occupational cancers, we don't have data. And in practice, the true extent of occupationally related ill health may be unknown. That's why today, this has become a major area in international research in industrial health and in many of the clinical super speciality, especially oncology. Now let me just give you some typical health risks which are simple to understand and we know a lot about them. Skin contact with irritant substance leading to dermatitis is very well known. Dermatologists, you don't have to be a dermatologist to actually assess the risk because you know the contact uh, agents. Inhalation of respiratory sensitizers triggering immune responses such as asthma is also very well known. Now you don't have to be a pulmonologist. My friend Rajesh Chawla in Casper would, would understand that this is, you don't have to be a pulmonologist or critical specialist to actually know that this is the basic science. Badly designed workstations requiring awkward body postures or repetitive movements result in upper limb disorders, repetitive strain injury, and other musculoskeletal. Do I need to be an orthopedic surgeon for this? No. I just have to understand the basic ergonomics, basic physiology not even a very fine level of medical science knowledge. Noise levels which are too high, causing deafness in conditions such as tinnitus. Do you need to be an ENT surgeon to know that? No. Too much vibration, for example, hand head tools leading to hand arm vibration syndrome and circulatory problems. Eye exposure to ionizing and non ionizing <coughs> radiation, including ultraviolet, in the sun's rays, causing burns, sickness, and, of course, skin cancer. Are these not perceivable? My friend from you, from Vardhwan Mahavir would agree. Do you agree? 
that these are simple things? And during an MBBS level, you can understand these? Fine, that's, that's good. Let's go ahead. Occupational health is about protecting the physical and mental health of workers and ensuring that their continual welfare in the working environment. If that is so, we should have ensuring fitness and physical capability to perform a job safely, health education and promotion, providing medical services including health surveillance and rehabilitation after injury or illness. That's the wider definition of occupational health. But what we practice is the third, not forgetting the first, second and the fourth. What we need to do is this diagram explains everything. So let's let's go a little bit slow at this point of time. If you see at the top is start, if workplace risk assessment, if there's no risk, stop. If there is uncertain risk, measure exposure, air bone, OELs, or if known risk is there, select control measures for exposure and spread of contamination. If that is so, you can do four activities. That is you can eliminate, you can do engineering modification, you can do administrative action, and you can do, you can apply personal protective equipment. If four of one of these you can use, then what you have to do? Ensure use of controls through information, instruction, and training. And have rules and procedures, then do supervision, and ensure continuing effectiveness of controls. Then, monitoring program by design and implementation and review its significant changes, new information every two to five years. And then, again do workplace risk assessment. So this becomes a circle. And a continuous process happens which will ensure that you are not only controlling health risk, you are reducing health risk. Hazard identification, as I said, was the first step. Most hazards can be identified based on knowledge and observation of the work activity through those specialist advice or assistance may be necessary. So you need consultants in each speciality. But core work you have to do. The most common agents like you to present health hazards at so one example I have given. This is at quarries because that is a hazardous occupation. So if you see you have to dust, noise, vibration, you have to identify which particular is there. You must be able to see a lot of question mark. That's the problem. We don't have sufficient knowledge that this is this is actually so. But we should be able to do research and find out what in your particular organization that particular risk is happening and how to control that risk. The two major elements that need to be considered are the potential consequences of exposure to the hazard and the potential exposure to the hazard. So these two uh, will help you in actually doing risk assessment through uh, this paradigm, which is hazardous properties, their potential severity, and on the other, other side, physical form, quantity and activities, potential of exposure, and then risk of harm. Now, when we measure potential severity, it is related to the properties of the hazard, as you know. For example, toxicity of a chemical, sound pressure, level at the operator's ear, and the frequency of the noise source, the intensity and penetrability of the ionizing radiation. Potential exposure we have to measure, and then you apply this by controlling the risk. If the risk is shows that it is harmful, then you have to create a hierarchy of risk control, elimination, reduction of risk, minimizing the risk, and using PPE as I told earlier. A risk control is through use of PPEs and widespread adequate exposure, then you have to ensure that hierarchy of risk control uh, is utilized through specific intervention. Uh, this is a responsibility of both employer and employee through working procedures, codes of practice, other procedure controls. And ensuring uh, proactive monitoring, sampling and exposure monitoring, and then ensuring that surveillance activity is built in through the whole process. Because ultimately, you have to control that this is actually, you have to create evidence that this is actually improving the situation on the ground. If not improving, you got to do intervention. So this is uh, a model that I have shown here in this slide where dust and noise I have shown and hazard and then possible ill effect and then control levels and then health surveillance. So you can create a series of activities where this actually happens on a real time basis. So in, in, in short I would say 
unless you do health assessment and have surveillance mechanism in place, both together working, the person on the, on the ground will not be reassured that he is working in a safe environment, whatever industry he is working in. Ultimately, his effectiveness, his health and well-being results in the productivity of that organization and that organization's productivity and other organization's productivity leads to the economic growth of the country. Economic growth leads to happiness of the family and ultimately, ultimately, leadership in uh, amongst all the nations. And the all the growth occurs through these small measures. So the, the point that, uh, that we want to drive at, that small activity on the ground will actually result in actual growth on the field. Thank you so much for giving an opportunity to interact on this topic. Thank you so much.